Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Open it to uh, First Timothy. Um, uh, we're going to be studying this book for the next uh, probably, well, somewhere between a few months and six months. Um, so I don't know which one to say. I don't want to scare you with six, um, but it's not true. Yeah, we'll use the Christian word season. We'll be in this book for the next season. Good luck on defining that. So Paul, he wrote a lot of the New Testament that we're about to read. He's the the famous uh, apostle, preacher, church planter. Um, He planted a church in Ephesus. He labored for years planting a church in what is Western Turkey. And uh, he gives birth to this church and he's there for a few years and then he has to say farewell. How difficult must that have been? Uh, to have had the Apostle Paul teaching at your church and then to have to say goodbye. And who in the world had to follow him? I mean, that's a rough gig. Well, he's not Paul. He's no Paul. So Paul says farewell to the church. And before he says farewell, he takes the elders, leaders out to breakfast to give them a talking to. He charges them. And you can read the charge in Acts chapter 20. It's, It's really powerful. But he takes these leaders to breakfast and says, this is, what you, this is what I want you to do while I'm gone. He says, I want you to look after this flock like shepherds. And I also want you to know that wolves are coming in, not just in from the outside, but they'll rise up from the inside. And what these wolves will do is they'll start teaching things that lead people astray. Well, sure enough, this is what happens in the church in Ephesus. Paul himself can't go deal with what's happening in the church that he loves so much. So he sends someone that he loves so much, Timothy, to represent him and to take care of what's happening. This is the context for this letter, 1 Timothy. And we'll start uh, verse 3 of chapter 1 and we'll read this charge. This is a charge from Paul to Timothy who's been tasked with dealing with false teachers and setting things in order. Some things are just off. And so he sent Timothy to deal with those things. As I urged you, Timothy, when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. We know that Timothy had a tendency to back off, to be hesitant, to be timid. And so here's Paul charging him, you're going to want to leave, but don't leave. You hang in there. You stand in. Remain in Ephesus so that you can charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless. And the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted." Holy Spirit, we just invite you to help us 
uh, understand what's being said here in this passage. Would you search our hearts? Know us? Um, yeah, is there anything that needs to change in us? Anything you want to address? And then, Holy Spirit, would you lead us to the cross? Would you lead us to Jesus? Not into trying harder or striving, but in yielding to uh, Jesus. Trusting in his work and in his love for us. We look to you. We want you to lead us. And everyone said, amen. Um, my uh, daughters have uh, homework, and occasionally I help them with, my, with their homework. Um, one of the things that I often get asked to do is to help them with their vocabulary, their vocab, where, right, I give them a word and then they give me a definition. And uh, I said this in the first service, and I thought, I was talking very confidently about vocabulary and then looked out and saw many teachers who were looking at me like, you may or may not know what you're talking about. Uh, but I think I'm right, and so uh, I'll say it again. Um, vocabulary is like this. You, you don't know what a word means unless you can define it in your own words. You have to use words that you can grasp in order to add a word to your vocabulary that you can't grasp, right? You can't define a word with a word. You know, what if I said to my daughter, you know, assertions, and she was like, assertions, you know, and you're like, no, 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 hold on. You can't define a word with the same word. You have to use your words to define this word in order to add that word to your quiver or have a grasp on it. In order to have a handle on a word, you have to use the words that you can handle to define it or to summarize that word. Am I all right, English people? Maybe? Okay, I'll try again a little later. Um, doc doctrine. Doctrine is like this. It's, it's essentially putting the Bible's teaching on a particular topic into our own words. And so your doctrine is sound then whenever your own words summarize what the Bible teaches rightly and, and faithfully. That's sound doctrine. Let me try another analogy. We all have a sense of direction. We all. We all have some sort of compass inside of us. I don't know if it works or not. But we all have a sense of direction. How many here would pride themselves in their sense of direction? Like you refuse to enter an address into your phone because it's an insult to your sense of direction. I know where we're going. I can say this because my wife's not here. Stop the recording. Matt? I have... A horrible sense of direction. I have had a horrible sense of direction for a really long time. Uh, the good Lord gave me a bad compass. And the problem is, is I'm really opinionated and passionate as well. So it'd be one thing to have a bad compass and be kind and gentle. But I have a bad comp compass and I'm unaware of that, right? You can start the recording again. Tiffany's speaking at a women's retreat, so we won't talk to her about what was said this morning. My dad and I, my dad's not here either, so this makes this easier. But we used to get in like full-blown arguments about where something was at. Because I was so sure that Ivanhoe was in a certain direction. Or I was so sure which way 198 ran. And my dad would ask the question, wait, tell me which way you think Ivanhoe is? And he'd just get the biggest kick out of it. And I was like, dad, it's really clearly this way. <laughs> really insistent on it, you know? I think there was actually wagers made. Money was bet at times. But I have a bad sense of direction. You have a good sense 
of direction when your sense lines up with reality. A good sense of direction, right, is when the way you think actually corresponds with the way it is. That's a good sense of direction. So Timothy is dealing with teachers of the law who are summarizing things. And it's not right, nor is it faithful to what the Bible teaches or what Paul's laid down. Sound doctrine is a summary of the Bible's teaching, which is both faithful to the Bible and useful for life. Last week, we were talking about um, church done God's way. Since it's his house, he says these are the house rules. And he rules in his house by asking us to form and forge and maintain deep, committed relationships. That's how he builds his church is by building relationship in his church. That's how he wants it. And this week... I want about I would just want to talk about church done God's way is done with a value for and the teaching of sound doctrine. There is a set of beliefs that will produce health and strength in a body. And there is a set of beliefs that will make you sick and weak. Paul is constantly talking to Timothy about teaching and doctrine. In fact, in many ways, the charge that we read from chapter 3 where Paul says to Timothy, I want you to go, and in my absence, I want you to know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, how to do church. The reason he's having to say that to Timothy is because false teachers have risen up. And so he's come to set things in order because things are out of order, things are wonky, things are just a bit off. Before we jump into the text, I just want to ask a question. This is, a very, this is the pastoral uh, heart inside of me. What comes to mind when I say doctrine? When I say doctrine, you say what? I'm aware that for some of you, when I say that word, you just immediately think division. You immediately think of arguments. You immediately think of camps. You immediately think of classrooms. You immediately think boring. When I say doctrine, you say boring. Doctrine, boring, doctrine, boring. Rigid, legalistic. Splitting hairs, right? Impractical. These are some things I'm aware may come to mind for you. Others, it's like when I say doctrine, you're like, finally, doctrine, finally, doctrine, finally. Some of you, I say doctrine, and you can like smell the books. the smell of books <laughs> so essential it's so essential and you want everyone to know it's beautiful it's not boring it's beautiful if we know this much about God and we love him then how could knowing more about him not cause us to love him more oh It's crucial. It's vital. There's depth to it. It's beautiful. And you love it. For most of us, it's probably just D, all of the above. A bit of a mix, uh, maybe depending on the experiences you've had, right? So the idea is that the Bible has been used. And unfortunately, at times, it's been abused. And we're all trying to walk through that, right? Recognizing that folks are going to frame this differently, I do want to make this point. Maybe, hopefully, we can all agree on this. 
or if maybe by the end you'll agree with me on this. What I want to say is that doctrine is really, really important. It's really important. What you believe really matters. What you believe it really matters. In the church, we're hearing a bunch of this. We don't need any more doctrine. We need practical teaching. We don't need any more doctrine. We need practical Bible teaching. As if those two things are opposed to one another. Well, Paul didn't think so. There's no difference between those things for Paul. He would have none of that. Paul would say sound doctrine is for living. Sound doctrines for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Sound doctrine for Paul is practical teaching because the way you behave is based in rooted in your beliefs. What you believes, what you believes really matters. What you believe determines how you uh, behave. I think this is so interesting. There's this really long list that's awkward for all of us. It's for the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to what? Sound doctrine. What? Listen, your behavior is determined by your beliefs. And what Paul's saying here is that your behavior is actually not the problem. You think your behavior is the problem. But I actually think it's the beliefs that lead to that behavior. What you believe about yourself. What you believe about who God is. What you believe about the good life. What you believe about him. That's the issue here. That's what we need to get at if we're going to deal with the behavior is the beliefs that are giving birth to these things. Inside the church, we're hearing doctrine doesn't matter. Give us practical teaching. Three things that start with P, right? Or something along those lines. Outside the church, we're hearing this. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. It doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters that you believe, okay? So it matters that you have faith. The object of your faith, not so much. But we care ultimately that you're sincere and that you're passionate about what you believe. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you really believe it. You do you. And that's... This is the air we breathe. Again, Paul would have none of this. I've never talked to him. I'm just guessing he would have none of that. Jesus would have none of that. Our homeboy. The hippie. He'd have none of it. We have no problem with Jesus saying, I'm a way. I'm a truth. I'm one way to live your life. But Jesus said, I'm the way. The, not a, the, the way. I'm the truth. No one comes to the Father except by me. The truth is exclusive and it's uncomfortable. Certainly that can't mean that. I I don't know. I was thinking about this and I was like, what if, what if my dad, in the name of love, was like, Travis, you seem so adamant that Ivanhoe's in that direction. Ivanhoe's son is in that direction. You seem passionate. You seem very sincere. You're pointing in the wrong direction. And it's my job as a loving father to tell you as long as you sincerely believe that 198 runs that way, well, by golly, son, 198 runs that way. 
No, a loving father would say, that's, that's the, the Ivanhoe's not in that direction. I wouldn't go that direction if I were you. Get in the car, I'll take you to Ivanhoe. Is there such thing as north, south, east, and west? Or are we left to determine that by being passionate and adamant and sincere about our sense of direction? Jesus said, and this is, a, this is, a, this is wild, he, he said he came into the world for this reason, to bear witness to the truth. He came to help your bad compass, to lay it down, north, south, east, west. He came to bear witness to the truth. And then Pilate, the Roman ruler, says these famous words, truth. What's truth? And this is the air that we uh, breathe. And I just want to say what we believe, super important. That it corresponds with reality, also very important. Doctrine can make a church healthy and thrive. It can make it sick and shipwrecked. If our doctrine is sound, it'll produce a sense of health here. So there's loads of teaching out there. This isn't the only place you can get Bible teaching. And everyone has words. And everyone has a way. And so how do we know there's one word or one way, right? There's so many options out there, Travis. How do we understand good teaching or, or sound doctrine? Well, I think Paul helps us right here. And I, I just want to talk about, talking about practical teaching, I just want to talk about three things. <laughs> These are pastor jokes. I thought that was funny, but you don't. That's fine. I spend a lot of time with books. <laughs> How do you recognize bogus Bible teaching um, is the question that I think Paul answers here for us. How do you recognize bogus Bible teaching? The first thing is that it promotes speculation. Paul says of these false teachers that they devote themselves to myths and to endless genealogies, and those promote speculations. The problem here is that they, they, they like devote themselves to these things, right? They're more devoted than YouTube than to the local church, right? If you want to make a name for yourself, uh, you got to come up with something new and novel. And this is the temptation that every preacher and teacher faces, is that if you're going to stand out, if you're going to make a name for yourself, if you're going to draw a crowd, the temptation is towards something new and uh, novel. I just recently did Greg and Kelly's wedding. They got married. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was, I was going to perform the ceremony, and I found myself thinking, well, I just want to remind them of the gospel. And then I thought, no, I can't do that. i got to come up with some new novel spin on it. I, I can't just tell them, right, the gospel. And there's this huge temptation to impress the guests with some new angle on the old truth. That Jesus did this for us, and so you should do this for your spouse. I just thought, oh, it's so boring, right? This is where we get in trouble. If you're sick of John 3.16... You're headed towards trouble. Some new spin on it. And again, it's tempting for me. Let's find some new, well, where John was coming from. Is it, yeah, you know, and it's like, come on, man. New and novel got these guys in trouble. If it's not new and novel, the other thing you could do is make it very deep and very complex. You can't stand up as a Bible teacher and just simply say, right, I believe what everyone else believed before me. The response from the crowd would be, get a brain or a take of your own. You can't just simply say, I hold to what we've held for for centuries. We expect people to have something fresh, some nuance, 
some new take or angle on it all. So we come up with hidden Bible codes. And then 666 has spelled like every president's name we've ever had. And then that's not what it literally means. That's like an allegory for something way more fantastic than what it actually says, right? And you got to see those dates. And those dates, if you turn them upside down, make these other dates. And there's 12 tribes, and that relates to the stages of human history. And did you know that Thomas had a gospel? And then the Gnostics had a gospel, and that starts with a G. It doesn't even start with an N. So that must be really profound. Did you read the Da Vinci Code, right? You've heard, I don't need to, we all know what's going on here, right? So here's the idea. If it's a speculation, then it's a guess. And if it's a guess, then I wouldn't probably take notes on it if I were you. The other thing is distraction. It creates within a church. Bogus Bible teaching will create distraction. Listen to this line. I think this is so powerful because I think Paul's propping these words up. He's saying they promote speculation rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. In the NIV it reads, such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work. This is the big issue, is we're still in these vain discussions when we should be advancing God's work. Instead of the main and plain things being the main and plain things, we're speculating about vague things. We're spending our time on what God didn't say and ignoring what He did say. He did say this and do this, and there's a stewardship. What are you going to do with what you do understand? Not what are you going to do with what you don't understand. And it creates within a church distraction. And here's the thing. It's not usually bad stuff. Not here anyway. It's not bad stuff. It's just stuff that should never be the focus. It's not bad stuff. It just should be at the bottom of the totem pole. But everyone knows someone who their thing has become like the thing. And somehow blood moons is way up the totem pole, you know? And you're like, well, there there is the the blood of Jesus. That's a big deal. And it's like, no, no, no. But the blood moons, you know? And you're like, no, no way. There's no way that these main plain things should not be the things. And we're spending all our time on vague things instead of advancing God's work. It's not bad stuff. Blood moons, whatever. It's not bad stuff. It just should never be that high on the totem pole. It creates distraction within a church. The third thing Paul says, this is how you can spot the bogus uh, Bible teaching, is a sort of confident ignorance. They desire to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So here's the problem. They're also like really confident about things that aren't certain. You've been around confident ignorance before, right? If if you're in an area of expertise, I'm guessing you've been around this. When someone's talking, Like, they know, but they don't know, and you're there, and you do know, and you're just waiting for an opportunity to politely interrupt them and say, that's not it, and that's not true, and you don't know what you're talking about. I want to apologize. We have a number of, like, doctors and nurses here, and when I go to the doctor, I apologize because... I, I don't know how many com- people come in confident ignorance because they Googled something. And they already know the diagnosis. And I'm sorry, too bad for you. I'm sad you went to school for eight years because all I had to do was Google it. And like, seriously, look at this picture of the rash and then look at my rash. <laughs> See it. I'm just here for the meds, right? <laughs> if you work in medicine, you've been around confident ignorance. This time of year, we're watching playoff baseball. I'll spare you. There's Dod- there was Dodger things that wanted to come out of my mouth, but they're not. 
breathe. So some of us are watching playoff baseball. But I remember I was so excited. Uh, the Mills family went to this church for a long time. Brad Mills coached the Red Sox, he coached the Houston Astros, coaches now the Cleveland Indians. And his son, Bo, played, played professional ball too. So they got ousted from the playoffs, and I got invited to their house to watch a playoff game. And I thought, I'm going to sit next to Brad Mills and watch a game. This is exciting, you know? And it wasn't. It was terrible. <laughs> Want to know why? I didn't get away with any of my confident ignorance. <laughs> if I watch a game with Nate, I say something like, come on, catch the ball. And we go, yeah, catch the ball. And if I'm screaming at the TV in front of Brad, he'd say, you can't actually get to that ball and the angle on the lights. And you're like, shut up, Brad. We're just yelling at someone right now. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, actually, that's a hard catch. I could make that catch. <clears throat> no, you couldn't. <laughs> I remember saying to Bo, I was like, I could hit John Lester. And he goes, no, no, you can't. No, he just left it there. He didn't even explain it. It was just like, you're an idiot, and you should go back to watching baseball with your other idiot friends, you know, like, so that you can armchair quarterback this thing, because you actually don't know what you're talking about. These teachers have this thing going on where Paul's like, uh, I am an expert, and you don't even know what you're talking about, and if I were there, I'd tell you so. Being very confident in areas that are not black and white is a sign of bogus Bible teaching. Acting like things are certain when they're not is an indication of bogus Bible teaching. This passage is a great one. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Whenever it becomes your focus to figure out things that God didn't tell us, you're into speculation and not the stewardship that we're called to. Again, you can have a conversation about this stuff. I'm not saying don't ever bring this up. I'm just saying a discussion is very different than devoting yourself to that stuff. And people end up with an unhealthy preoccupation with something. They devote themselves to it. They don't just discuss it. And, and I think that, that that's not necessarily what God would have for us. So how do you spot the good stuff? How do you know you're listening to good Bible teaching? All right, Trav, hot shot. What's, what's the good stuff look like? So... The first thing is that Paul says the aim of our charge is love. The aim of our command is love. That issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. You can spot the good stuff when you spot love, a pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. If these things are being produced, then you're next to and into some good Bible teaching. We'll spend the majority of our time just on love, because I know when I say sound doctrine produces love, that some of you are like, that's not been my experience. I don't know what doctrine and love have to do with one another. Seems to me that there are those who have love and bad doctrine. And there are those that have good doctrine and are just really bad at love. So how would we have these together? Love and doctrine. Love and sound doctrine. On the one side, there are those willing to tolerate all kinds of error in the name of love. And they think love is that we just don't argue about stuff. So it's a sort of tolerance. And in the name of love, they'll put up with just about anything. As long as we don't fight about it, there's no reason to fight about it. We're, we're, we're called to love. And then on the other side, there are those that sometimes you want to ask them this question. Do you practice the doctrine of love as much as you love your doctrine? 
Do you love God or do you love doctrine? Do you love people or do you love doctrine? One of the marks of good doctrine is that it will make you good at love. Let me read to you the other thing that I never want to read at a wedding. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I'm a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and I'm the ultimate Bible answer man, And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. You can drill down super deep. And if that doesn't lead to a deep love, it's nothing. Mark 12, 28, one of the scribes came up and uh, heard uh, them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked this question, hey, what is the most important commandment of all? This is cool because usually the scribes and Pharisees were always asking questions to trap Jesus. And then Jesus always gives brilliant answers. And then one of the scribes goes, man, he's got some good answers. He's answering these things really well. I'm not asking a question to trap him. I actually want to know what he thinks. I, know what, I want to know how Jesus would answer this question. And so you could see this scribe walking up with his Bible and just saying, this thing's really fat. There are a lot of words in it, really small print. Two columns on each page. There's a lot of laws in here. What one's the most important? I'm, 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 I'm lost in the weeds, Jesus. There's no pictures in here. This Bible used to make sense to me when it had a pop-up of Noah's Ark in it. And there aren't any photos anymore. What's the point of this book? What's the point? What's most important? The most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. In Revelation 2, you can read about this church in Ephesus. And Jesus uh, speaks to this church and he commends this church, the same church that Paul's writing to, Jesus speaks to, and he commends them and he says to this church, you're killing it in doctrine. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and you found them to be false. Well done. And you've persevered during tough times. But somewhere along the line, this church had lost its love. And Jesus rebukes them. I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Repent and do the things you did at first. We always read this passage and you think about the Righteous Brothers song, You've Lost That Love and Feeling. No one confirmed this. Is that a Righteous Brothers song? confident in ignorance. It's a righteous it's a righteous brother's song. I'm sure of it. We we read this text and it, it, this is what comes to mind. Man, I just don't feel the way I used to feel or cry the way I used to cry. And I think it's a package deal and our feelings are important, important but I think it's really interesting when Jesus says repent and do. Do the things. Obey me. Obey me. Do what I've asked you to do. Prefer others and put their needs before you. Philip Ryken stumbled on this quote. I thought it was great. 
wherever doctrine is purest, love must be the highest. And that maybe has not been our experience, but let's go for that together. Let's give it a whirl. This love, it issues from a pure heart. Pure heart's probably not a word that you use very often. The word that we use in our language is character. Good Bible teaching should conform us into the character of Christ. Should challenge our character. A good conscience might not be a word that you use, but here's the idea. Obedience. Obedience. Good Bible teaching should prompt obedience. Listen, if you're not obedient, if you're disobedient, you're going to have a bad conscience. If you're obedient, you do what ask God, God asks you to do. You sleep well at night. It's great. If you don't ignore the sirens going off inside of you, it leads to a good night's sleep. Good Bible teaching should produce an obedient bunch. We're going to do that. And sincere faith. What's sincere faith? Is that pointing in the direction and being like super adamant about it? What's that? No, this is trusting in God. Good Bible teaching should cause you to trust in God. Not trust in yourself or trust in what you can do, but to look to Him, to see Him, to trust in Him, to value Him above all others. So we come asking the question when we read the Bible, how can I grow in love for God? What does this reveal to us about God? How can I love others? How can my character look like Christ? How can I obey what He's asking me to do in this? And what does it look like to trust Him and worship Him only? I'll use the rest of our time, the short time, to talk about the whole Old Testament and how to deal with it. A lot of these speculations and these genealogies and these myths and these ideas then came from the Old Testament and today come from the Old Testament. And so Paul says a bit like, hey, the law is good if used lawfully, but then Paul doesn't explain to us what does it mean to use the law lawfully? What is a lawful use of the law? First, just a, a, just a word. When he says law, you know, don't, I don't want you to think like the speed limit or, you know, those laws. I, I want you to think of the first five books of the Bible. All those rules and regulations contained in the first five books. Deuteronomy, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. A lot of rules, a lot of regulations in those books. I want you to think when you read law here, think about that. How do we use that lawfully? What's the point of those books for us. If we're not supposed to speculate about genealogies, if we're not supposed to try to figure out what God didn't say, what do these laws do? Well, Paul mentions what these laws do elsewhere. The first thing you need to know about the law is that it's not meant to be a stairway to heaven. It doesn't work as that. Paul would say it this way in Galatians 3.20, no one will be declared righteous by eating a certain way. No one will be declared righteous by worshiping on a certain day. No one will be declared righteous by crossing their T's and dotting their I's. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscience, conscience of our sin. It doesn't work to make you righteous. What it does is reveal sin. That's the second point. The law is excellent at exposing our sin. Romans 7.7, 7, Paul would explain it like this. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. It exposes our sin. Listen, there's a lot of things that would just become, they, they come naturally to us. We wouldn't know that they're wrong if it weren't for the law going, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Revenge makes a ton of sense to me. I'm like, I'm bought into the idea of revenge. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. It's, it comes very natural to me. And I wouldn't know it was sin if it weren't for the law. 
Because my friends around me would go, yeah, do that. They would. You would. Revenge feels really natural. Lying? When, you're, when the hammer's dropping? I've never, had to t- I've never taught my kids how to do that. I've never had to say, this is, you just make up a story. You want to dodge to the left, you know. It comes really naturally to us. And we probably could have gone, this makes sense. If it weren't for the law going, I wouldn't do that if I were you. It exposed our sin. What do you do when you see a wet paint sign? You touch the paint. David, what do people do when they see a wet paint sign on this church grounds? They touch the paint. What have you done in your life when you've seen a wet paint sign? Touch the paint. Thanks, David. There is this proclivity in all of us when there's some lines drawn to go. The law does a great job of exposing that. The law was intended to then point us to Jesus, to not just expose our sin, but what we were supposed to throw ourselves on the mercy of God. We were supposed to see our sin and it was supposed to point us to Jesus. We were supposed to see our sin and we were supposed to cry, Lord, help me. Throw ourselves on his mercy. Galatians 3 says it this way, 23, before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us. It had like a governing effect. But then the law was meant to hand us over to Jesus. There was a handoff that took place. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. The purpose of the law was to show us our sin, but it could not lead us to righteousness. It couldn't do that, but Jesus could. The law was designed, using the law lawfully, it was designed so that we could all find ourselves on this list. We can all find ourselves on the list. You know the awkward list? The one that I'm going to read again? It's just like, man. The law is not laid down for the just, but for the wet paint touchers. What I hate about this list is like, I dodge one and then I take one square on the nose. You're like, lawless? I don't know, that's kind of extreme. Disobedient? Dang it. The ungodly? Certainly not. I'm a pastor. Sinners? Stink. The unholy? The profane? For those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever is contrary to sound doctrine. Hey, this list is tough. If I'm honest, I just wish that it wasn't here. I honestly wrestled, like, would it be more loving just to leave the list off? What actually is more loving? If you're here and you're homosexual, the last thing I would want you to feel is targeted this morning. The last thing I would want you to feel is not welcome here or not safe. And so in love, I'd love to leave this list out, and many have. But I've been asking myself the question, what what is most loving? I think there's a tendency with that one in particular. We can minimize it and leave it off the list. The theological left has. Or we can maximize it and make it its own list. Like it belongs on some other list. And the right has done that. 
It's on the list. But we're all on the list. We're all on the list. I believe that homosexuality is on the list. I I also believe that no one is straight. That's what I believe. And that's what Paul would say if he were here probably. So we find ourselves on this list. Every one of us is in is in is on the guest list. <clears throat> We have a number of options. Let me read to you your options going forward. The first is that we can compare our sins. We can compare our sins to the sins of others. And we can feel straight by determining that others are more crooked. You can do that if you want. You can do the whole Pharisee thing and say, at least I'm not like that guy. Your other option is you can try harder to follow the rules and be righteous. You can do that. The third option is that you can run away in shame because you feel like your sin was spotted and called out. And so you can be ashamed and you can run away. The fourth option is you can refuse the words of Scripture on the grounds that they're old and antiquated and you can deny and reject the authority of scripture that's that's totally an option for for all of us here or you can exercise the option that Paul exercised we can move towards the glorious good news of what God has done through Christ if we were on this list what should we do if you've been called out What should we do? Let's find ourselves on the list and then let's find ourselves in God's grace. Let's run towards him, recognize our need for him and move towards him all together. No one exempt from this call. Paul put himself at the top of the list. It's not like Paul was one of those preachers who was like, you, 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 you. Right after this list, he says, me, I'm chief among sinners. I take the top spot on this list. Everyone's on the list, but I put myself at the top of the list. But I received mercy. I ran towards God, not away in my shame. And for a long time, guys, I just tried harder. Tried, tried harder because I thought this stairway was going to work out. It didn't work in the end. No, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on my behalf that I might become the righteousness of God. I'm asking you, would you not run away in shame? Would you not compare yourself to others? Would you not deny the authority of Scripture? Would you move towards God's glorious grace in Christ? And do what Paul did. Move towards him. Even, even when we're seeing that we're sick with what is not so sound doctrine. Monica, would you come? I'm realizing that you can't bring up, you know, I thought, well, last week was the relational week. And there's probably a lot of people who are hurt because relationships hurt. And so we should pray for people. And then I realized, man, this week in talking about doctrine uh, scripture has been used and abused, and my guess is that people have been hurt and are having a hard time moving through certain things. So if you feel spotted and called out this morning, uh, we'd love to pray uh, for you, pray with you. So a ministry team will be up here. If you're feeling like, man, doctrine has become for me an idol, or doctrine has become for me a dirty word. And I want to move past that. Would you stand with me? We lift up Jesus. We praise Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your glorious gospel.
We thank you, Jesus, for being full of grace and full of truth and not denying either one. And somehow, people are drawn to you. I'm drawn to you. I think the way you do this is amazing. Help us. At one moment, Jesus, you would say, go and sin no more. You'd call it sin and you'd say, stop. And in the next moment, you'd say, neither do I condemn you. Uh, Yeah, I help. Help us. And where we've loved doctrine and not loved people, we repent. Where we've loved people and not loved the truth, we repent. Would you help us have a balance and have health here in this uh, church? Amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. Divide